The following broadcast is brought to you by the friends and partners of Revival Ministries International. Give Jesus a great big hand clap in Tampa. (laughs) Hallelujah. Before you're seated, say out loud with me, we serve a living God. We serve a God. Before you're seated, I'm going to read something to you. This woman just wrote in about 10 days ago. God used Jonathan to lay hands on my mother back in April. She had cirrhosis of the liver and was given three months to live. Her mother was not a Christian. Jonathan laid hands on her and believed God to remove any disease, growths, cancer, terminal illness in Jesus' name. And since she's been doing amazing, she had her appointment yesterday at Penn Hospital in Philadelphia to get info on whether she still needed a transplant or not. The surgeon came in asking my mom when she had her hepatectomy, which is partial remover of the liver. The surgeon said, uh, uh, she, my mother said, I've, I haven't had one. The surgeons could not explain why, but the scan was showing that an entire lobe of her liver was missing with a perfect cut where it had been removed. They stared in disbelief at my mom and sisters and brother who were all in the room showing them all where she had to have had the procedure done because it was gone. It's amazing to continue to see what God did in her life and seeing the scan and how perfect of a line it was where the entire lobe that was affected was. Jesus is still the great physician. And there's nothing the devil has done to anybody that God can't turn it around in one hour. God God created the whole world in six days. How long do you think he needs to sort out your life? Lift both hands to the Lord as we approach his word. Father, thank you that you never called an assembly ever unless it was with the intention to bless the people who responded. Every person who's here, every person watching on television and YouTube, I thank you that now is their time to encounter your word and encounter your power and never be the same. And just like you did with my grandfather on my dad's side and my mother, that even if they're the first in their family to make a decision to serve Jesus Christ, let the reward of that decision blow through the entire family. Let every prison door come open on every family member today. Let every chain that's been wrapped around any family member drop off supernaturally today. Every brother, every sister, every son, every daughter, every mother or father that the devil is sure will spend eternity in hell. Let today be the hour of their deliverance in Jesus' mighty name. And we give you the praise, we give you the honor, and we give you the glory because you're a prayer answering God. Thank you that we don't serve a stone idol or a wood idol with an ugly face. We serve the living God who made the heavens and the earth. And we thank you that you answer us today in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, give the Lord God another great hand clap and you can be comfortably seated. Well, nice to be with you today. I, of course, am Pastor Rodney Howard Brown. And everything is exactly as it should be. If you have your Bible, open it with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians, the third chapter. Galatians chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 6, in the same way Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. Say that with me. The real children of Abraham are those who put their faith in God. 
What's more, the scriptures looked forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed the gospel to Abraham long ago when he said all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing that Abraham received because of his faith. So the first part lets you know that when you get born again, that prophecy that God gave to Abraham that through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed was fulfilled. Because, I mean, if you're standing where I'm standing and look from left to right, you know, I hear everybody talk about white evangelical churches. I, I've never found one. When you preach the gospel, people show up of every skin shade. And if you're standing where I'm at, it looks like a gathering of uh, United Nations General Assembly. You have every skin color. Because the blessing was not supposed to be for Abraham's physical descendants only. But the Bible says that through Abraham's seed, and Abraham's seed was Christ, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so you're grafted into that vine wherever you come from, West Africa, South Africa, Asia, uh, Ireland, Puerto Rico, whatever your ethnic background is, it becomes non, uh, it doesn't matter. When you get saved, the Bible says you're the wild vine that's now been grafted in uh, uh, to the tree that is Jesus. Can you say amen? So then most people will concede that, but then they say, yeah, oh yeah, that's true. But then the blessings were just for the Jews. But then the Bible says, uh, the same way you were grafted into that, the Bible says, all nations will be blessed through you, verse 9. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing. Everybody say, same blessing. Same. So there's not a lesser Gentile, uh, Gentile blessing. It's the same blessing that Abraham received because of his faith. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under its curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, the just shall live by faith. This way of faith is very different from the way of the law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. But Christ has redeemed us from all the curse of the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for my wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, I know it says our wrongdoing, but I always say my because, you know, you're on your own. i got to worry about me. <laughs> the curse, everybody say, he took the curse for my wrongdoing. <laughs> for it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. And if you study the crucifixion, uh, that was supposed to take four hours or four days. Jesus died in less than six hours where they thought he was faking his death. Because Jesus, when he hung on the cross, took in his body and on himself all cancer, all poverty, all, you name it, everything that came with the fall of man, Christ took that in his body for you and me. So the Bible says when he died, he broke the curse. But Christ has redeemed. Everybody say has redeemed. There's another place where people miss it. Because if you grew up in another kind of church, they teach that Egypt is a type of the world and Canaan is a type of heaven. And so the Passover lamb that represents Jesus broke us out of, of, the, of uh, sin and then one day we'll go to heaven and get the blessings. But Canaan's not a type of heaven. Because when they went to, to Canaan, they didn't just get ushered in by God. There were giants in the land. They had to fight battles to get in, and they had to fight battles to stay in. As soon as they kicked, kicked those groups out, those groups rallied to try to push them back out. So when you hear about full gospel churches, which is a weird term because you never drive by a church and it says half gospel or 13% gospel. But where, where full gospel comes from, is the understanding, basically, that Egypt was a type of sin and Pharaoh was a type of the bondage of Satan. That God sent Moses to say, let my people go, and Pharaoh said, I'll never let them go. But God had already told Moses, I know he won't let them go, but I will force him with signs and wonders and execute judgment against the gods of Egypt. Can you say amen? amen. And so when he did that through Moses, it's a type of Jesus breaking the hold the devil's hold on his children. And then he didn't just break the devil's hold. He didn't just break them out of the curse and now they lived in Egypt free. He took them out of Egypt. The Bible says in Psalm 105, 37, the 105th Psalm and the 37th verse, he brought them out of Egypt loaded with silver and gold. Everybody say loaded with silver and gold. And there was not one feeble amongst their tribe. Not that there wasn't one, one sick, there wasn't one feeble. Not, not just nobody was sick. No, everybody had strength. When the pillar of fire moved, 
When the cloud by day moved, there was nobody. People always laugh when I, I'm, I'm not making a joke. There was no like, like you think. If you had to march through the desert and there were 83-year-olds, 91-year-olds, not one 91-year-old person had to come up and say, um, Moses, my husband, Hank, you know, we've been sleeping on the sand. And in Egypt, we were used to a soft mattress. Our sleep number bed was 20, and the sand is very hard. And my husband's in his early 90s. He, he can't walk, you know, a- anymore today. Nobody had to say, I can't walk. Every time the pillar of fire moved and the cloud moved, everyone from the youngest to the oldest, there was not one feeble amongst their tribe. In fact, in Deuteronomy, God expounds on it further. He says, remember that your shoes never wore out and your feet never blistered or swelled. There were no laundromats or washing folds. God supernaturally kept their clothes and their shoes, loaded them with silver and gold, and kept them strong the entire time that they went through the wilderness. There's a great full gospel scholar that's in heaven now named Finnis Dake. And Finnis Dake writes in the note on his Bible on Psalm 105, 37. He said, if God could enrich his children and keep them strong and healthy under the old covenant, and he can't do it now, then we ought to leave this covenant and go back under the better covenant. Then he writes a second paragraph. But the fact is, the Bible says in Hebrews 8, 6, we now have a better covenant. Everybody say a better covenant. We now have a better covenant built on better promises. Everybody say better covenant built on better promises. And so we didn't go backwards. So anything you see as a picture, if the Old Testament looks back to the Passover, where a lamb without spot or wrinkle was killed without breaking any of its bones, its blood drained into a basin, and hyssop branches applied over the doorpost of every house. That's what broke them out. That was a type of Christ. If the thing that represented Christ was able to endue the children with wealth and with permanent health and strength, how much more under a better covenant built on the actual blood of Jesus can the people of God today claim those blessings? If you believe that with me, put those hands together one more time and let the Lord know that you appreciate the covenant that he gave. Can you say amen? Where did I put that Bible? Oh, oh what, a, what a terrible place to put it. Everybody say, Christ has redeemed me from all the curse of the law. The Bible says, when he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for my wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. Now the second part, he didn't just remove the curse. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed, not will blessed. So everybody say, has redeemed. Has redeemed. Everybody say, has blessed. Yeah, that's the opposite of will redeem and will bless. will bless. So if you go to a church that doesn't understand those things and the country's packed with them, then they always are talking about heaven. Well, how many know we're sinners now, but one day we'll get to heaven and we won't have our sins anymore. The Bible doesn't say he's going to take your sins away in heaven. The Bible says the blood of Jesus has cleansed us of all unrighteousness and made us perfect. Can you say amen? amen. Dios te bendiga, Papa. God, Christ has redeemed us. Can you say Amen. So our sins aren't going away. The curse isn't going away. The curse was removed. But it's not enough to remove the curse. I heard that lady giving the awesome testimony about how the Lord's been using her to minister in prison. If you minister in prison and then you study prison a little bit, when people get set free, almost 9 out of 10, more than 8 out of 10 and just under 9 out of 10, go back to prison within two years. Why? Because if they set you free from prison and you stand outside the prison and you don't have anywhere to go, you don't have anybody to help you, then the, even the person that picks you up from prison. When I preached in prison, I met a guy who told me. He said, when I got released from prison, the guy, the guy that I called, because I was asking him why they're there, he said, the guy I called to pick me up out of prison, uh, you know, wasn't a good guy. A lot of times prisoners don't have, like, librarians for friends or accountants. So he, he said, the guy that came and picked me up uh, drove away from the prison and then we got pulled over by a cop because his car wasn't registered. And when he searched the car, there was marijuana in the car. And I went straight back to jail before I even got to go to my destination from leaving prison. So if all Christ did is break us out of sin, then we're wandering around with nowhere to go. But just like in the Old Testament, he'd just break them out of Egypt and say, well, best of luck out in the desert. The Bible says he told them, I have a land for you that's flowing with milk and honey. And though there's giants in the land, if you stay believing me by faith, you'll drive the giants out and will possess the land. Everybody say, has redeemed. has redeemed. 
And then everybody say, has blessed. Has blessed. So if you get at, broken out of prison and you don't have anybody to take care of you, you're going to be in trouble. But if you get broken out of prison and there's a Rolls Royce limousine waiting there with a driver and there's a house prepared for you, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. I prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. There's no enemies in heaven. God has a place of blessing with your name on it here on this earth if you'll stay trusting in him. If you believe it, can you say aloud amen? amen? But Christ has redeemed us from all the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us. For the scriptures say cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles. Everybody say, that's me. With the, there it is again, with the same blessing that he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit by faith. Now turn to verse 26 of the same chapter. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on a new garment. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. 29. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true seed of Abraham. You are his heirs, and everything that God promised Abraham belonged to you. Everything that God promised Abraham now belongs to you. Right in your seat, why don't you lift both hands to God, and let's take 20 seconds, open up your mouth, and just begin to thank God that the blessings of Abraham belong to you. I'm blessed. I'm not cursed. I'm blessed. Windows are open. Showers of blessing. Life doesn't have to be a struggle. God gave the same blessing that he gave to Abraham to the Shuttlesworth family, to your family. I'm not cursed. I'm blessed. Hallelujah. Say it so the devil can hear you. I'm not cursed. I'm blessed. Hallelujah. Yeah. I had a lady come up to me when I finished preaching. And she said, uh, Jonathan, I have a problem. I said, what's the problem? She said, I think I have a generational curse. I said, well, quit thinking you have one. If you fo whatever you focus on multiplies. There's a lot of depressed charismatics that love to focus on the curse. Do you have a generational curse in your family? There's a lady at a place I won't go preach anymore because I'm not sharing a stage with people that preach stuff that comes from hell. She was lining Christians up and telling them, though you're saved, there can still be demons that live in your soul and all this stuff. You know, that, that's, Christians love that stuff. It'll sell a lot of books. It'll keep you depressed. It'll keep you looking 25 years older than you actually are, walking with, with like... It'll keep you among the people that every time the preacher says, how many of you need a breakthrough today? You put your hand up. But when you start focusing on the blessings of God that belong to you and stop saying, I think I have a curse and instead say, through Christ Jesus, I know heaven's blessings belong to me and my children and my children's children. And you begin to open up your mouth and speak it like a mighty tide wave. The thing comes and overwhelms every attack of the devil that's against your life. If you believe that with me and you know you're blessed, clap your hands one more time and give God the greatest shout of praise. Now, I wasn't going to read this, but, not, but I feel like it now. Turn to Numbers 23. Numbers 23. I know, I like it too. Numbers 23, verse 19. This is what the Bible says. Not important what anybody else says. I don't believe that. You'd be surprised how little life matters about what you believe. <laughs> People are very confused when you finish preaching. They come and say, I didn't believe that. Say, no problem, I'm going to Waffle House. Amen. <laughs> life does not hinge on what you believe. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man, so he doesn't lie. He's not a human, so he doesn't change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Hallelujah. Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Listen, I have received a... The Bible said listen there. I'm not like scolding you. Listen, I received a command to bless. God has blessed, and I can't reverse it. No misfortune is in his plan for Jacob. Listen to that. No misfortune is in his plan for Jacob. Everybody say no misfortune. 
How many of you know sometimes life doesn't go the way we plan? I shut up. Everybody say, no misfortune. <laughs> no misfortune is in his plan for Jacob. No trouble. Everybody say, no trouble. <laughs> Hallelujah. Next time somebody says you, we have some trouble. Say, you might have some trouble, but I don't have any trouble. Can you say amen? Anybody ever hear the evangelist that's in heaven now, R.W. Shambach? You know, he used to have, a, he actually had a song written and performed that he'd open his TV broadcast with that went, you don't have any trouble, all you need is faith in God. Do you know where he got that from? There was a guy that was on his deathbed in Buffalo, New York, and people were praying for him at the tent meeting. And a priest came in and pronounced the last rites over him. You know, when they do that, it's over. And the priest walked out of the door, and then he said, in the middle of the night, he started to hear footsteps coming down the hall. And another priest came in that was Jesus, walked right through the wall. If you read the Bible, after Jesus rose from the dead, he likes doing that. I don't have to use doors anymore. <laughs> Just likes freaking people out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Walked right, right through, and Jesus appeared at his bedside, but didn't pray for him. And Jesus said, you don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. And he turned around and left. But when Jesus spoke that to him, the gift of faith came in that guy on the bed. And he lifted his hand and started to thank God. I don't have any trouble. I have faith in you. I receive your promises. Next thing you know, he stood up. They thought they gave him too much morphine. And he's just like wandering around. In his little hospital gown, he signs himself out. And he's at the meeting the next night. And when he told, when he told the whole tent what Jesus said, you don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. Are there giants in the land? Yeah. But they're not trouble. Joshua and Caleb said, if the Lord is with us, everybody say, the Lord is with me. If the Lord is with us, they're merely bread for us. Let us go at once and take the country and possess it from Jordan to the sea. Though there's giants there, if the Lord is with us. Say, I don't have any trouble. Yeah, the devil wants you to look at the waves. The devil wants you to look at the storm. But if Jesus is in your boat, though the storm is real, you can walk to the edge and say, wind and waves, be still. And immediately your command is obeyed. God has a promised land for you. Yes, there are giants in the land. Yes, there is some great big globalist plot and people in high chairs that have a plan to destroy the nations of the world and bring it under a one world system with a one world ruler called Antichrist. We know that from the Bible. But as long as the children of God here, they have a major problem because we are blessed and you cannot curse those whom God has blessed. Numbers 23. No misfortune is in his plan for Jacob. No trouble. Everybody say no trouble. <laughs> Lift your hands all over this room. Every negative report you've received concerning your home, your business, your own personal health, I curse that report in the name of Jesus Christ. No trouble is in the plan of God for his children. Jesus didn't die for you to have trouble. He died for you to be blessed, to be more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ your Lord. If you believe it, shout, I receive it. I receive it. No misfortune is in his plan for Jacob. No trouble is in store for Israel. For the Lord their God is with them. He has been proclaimed their king. He brought them out of Egypt. For them he is as strong as a wild ox. 23, Numbers 23, 23. So just remember, double Michael Jordan. No curse can touch Jacob. Everybody say, no curse. No curse can touch Jacob, and no magic has any power or divination. Now, Jonathan, there's witches that live in our apartment complex, and they found out I'm a Christian, and they've been cursing me. Okay. The Bible tells you it's not even worth praying about. Let me ask you a question. Everybody say no curse. No, curse. no divination. No, if every witch in India, if every witch in Central Africa all teamed up and made it their business to take you out, they know how to use the blood of chickens. We have the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus is greater than the blood of chickens, bulls, or anything else. God has blessed you. No devil can curse you. Yeah, yeah but Jonathan, you have to be careful, you know, because that stuff's real. Oh. Somebody should have told Elijah. 
when all the prophets of Baal and Astera, 850, gathered to undo his work, what was he doing? I bind them right now. I come against them right now. He just said, you, you, you have no authority. No. He was sitting back having a laugh. Perhaps your God is deaf. Perhaps your God's on vacation. Perhaps your God is relieving himself, just blaspheming their God left and right. And then he said, are you people done? Yeah, let me do it. And he knelt down and you can read his prayer. 14 and a half seconds if you read slow. And immediately fire flashed down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. We serve the living God. He knows your name. He loves you. He started you out and he'll bring you through to the other side. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So you're not only redeemed from the curse, you're not only blessed, the Bible says you can't be cursed. Everybody say uncursable. uncursable. There was a witch that came to our crusade. Of course, there were people from RBI helping us out. This witch came uh, and brought some of her friends, witch friends. Witchesmeat.com or wherever they find each other. The broom store. And so she had announced to everybody that she was coming. You know, she's a witch. And she's standing in the back going like this. So the one guy that was on the crusade team said, do you want... We're going to go pray against her. I said, if you pray against her, I'm sending you home. Because you never read the Bible. They're not even worth praying about. He said, what do you want us to do? I said, go take her some water. And say, that looks tiring. And it's hot out. Would you like something to drink? <laughs> you dummy. Because the Bible says, the curse causeless shall not come. And the more she starts doing that, it ain't coming on me. It's going to boomerang back on the camp of the wicked. You can't curse whom God has blessed. And many, many believers are so focused on the curse. We have a generational curse in our family. Alcoholism runs in our family. Are you saved? You're not in that family anymore. You joined a new family. And our dad is not an alcoholic. Our dad is God the Father. Our elder brother is Jesus. We have a new bloodline. We are blessed and we can't be cursed. I mean, look at it now. Look at it now. You have the highest powers at the United Nations. The highest powers at the G20 and central banks doing everything in their power to stomp out the church. And we keep multiplying. We're not in their realm. We're not equals. We're not eye to eye. The devil is not over your head. The devil is not eye to eye. The devil is permanently under your feet in Jesus' mighty name. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you something, because a lot of Pentecostal people, I grew up in that, are demon obsessed. We'd start church on Sunday morning. First person that gets the mic. Well, before we do anything, let's just take authority over the devil. Devil, you have no power here. We bind you. Next person gets up to lead worship. Does the same thing. Then the songs are about, you know, we're tearing you down. And then the next person comes up. Let's just, we bind the devil in Jesus' name. I was like nine years old thinking, if that sucker's that slippery, that he can get loose every eight minutes, we are fighting a losing battle. But when you read the Bible, there's another way to prevail. Like a fish can't survive out of water. The devil can't breathe in an atmosphere of praise and thanksgiving. So when you lift up holy hands unto God and shout with the voice of triumph and let hallelujahs ring out of your soul, it creates an atmosphere where the devil has no ability to prevail. So rejoice and be glad for the Lord has given you the victory. One more time so they can hear you in hell. Say, I am blessed. I, am blessed. I, can't, be I can't be cursed. Christ has redeemed me. Christ has redeemed me. 
from all the curse of the law. Turn to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. Verse 1. So before we read this, say, I'm not just free. Because if all you focus on is you being free, then you come to the next service and you need free again. I need to be free. People have been serving the Lord 13 years. I, I just need to be free. No, you already are free. Now you need to learn what's yours and start walking it. Because it doesn't just say he redeemed you from the curse of the law. It says that the blessings of Abraham might come upon all who believe. Well, if you're going to receive something, you have to know what it is. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. Here they are. Because this isn't God speaking to Abraham, but it is uh, the children of Abraham being reminded what they've been given. Summed up nicely in 14 verses. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, well, Jonathan, you know, I, but I don't know if I qualify. Because, quit thinking about whatever happened before. To, you know, I had a lady wait after for me this last week where I'm, where I'm preaching again tonight up in Canada. And she, you know, I, I've made a lot of mistakes and I haven't been going to church. And, and I said, where are you right now, oh, church? I said, who cares what happened five minutes ago and before? Why let the devil keep, I don't care what happened. It's, it's uh, whatever time it is right now. I don't, I don't care what happened 30 minutes ago. It's not important. What's important is what happens from here forward. So quit repeating the same story about how you have trouble serving. Whatever you say, what comes out of your mouth comes into your life. I have trouble serving the Lord. You know, Yeah, keep talking. You'll end up in hell. Start saying, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I can do, let me give you an easy scripture for a believer that, that, should, encump, that, that, that should be like the foundation of everything you do. I can do all things through Christ who infuses his strength into my inner man. Say it so every devil in Florida can hear you. Say, I can do all things, not most things, all things through Christ who gives me strength. If you fully obey, you know, in the Bible, well, I don't know if I can obey all the commands of God. The Bible says the commands of God are not burdensome, that they're easy to obey. Jesus summed them up in one line. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. This fulfills everything that's written in the law. If you do those two things, you can't sin. If you love somebody, you're not going to sleep with their wife, are you? If you love somebody, you're not going to take them to court and lie about them to get $20,000, are you? So if you love God with all your heart and love people, you will never, you'll never get out of line. Can you say amen? amen. Well, I don't go to church anymore because the pastor made me upset. Oh yeah, you got out of love. The Bible says you pray for people when they make a mistake. You don't get a permanent expression and quit going to church. Say, I can keep God's commands. How many of you know we all miss it every day? Keep talking like that and you'll end up in hell. I don't miss it every day. You know what I did today? I woke up uh, about an hour from here, and I'm preaching here now. The second I finish, I'm going to the Tampa airport to go to Montreal, Quebec, and pick up week two of the revival meeting that broke out there. I don't have time to sin today. If Satan himself appeared to me and said, Jonathan, look, I, I don't have time. I have a flight to catch. Excuse me, TSA, he is not a ticketed passenger. Can you say amen? Yeah. If you fully obey the Lord your God. So I don't know why religion feels like it's their job to get you to feel like you can't do it. Always keep you. How many of you know we miss it? How many of you know we don't pray as we should? Oh, please. Well, you, you can't tell people here that. You know, the American church doesn't pray. In other countries, they pray all night. We also pray all night here. 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Then are jacked up the next two days. Eating dinner at 8 a.m. Say it so your own spirit can hear it. Say, I am well able to do what God's called me to do and be who he's called me to be. 
If you fully obey the Lord, so then, then you get access to this. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will, look, why did Pastor Rodney go to Mongolia and they welcomed him as if he was a diplomat? He's high above all the nations of the world. So, so, and people can tell. People can tell in their spirits. I was in, um, <laughs> my wife's sitting on the front row, so you can know I'm not making up the story. I was in Barbados, and I was getting ready to leave after preaching, and I wasn't going to make the flight because even though I came two hours early, they had a real long backed up line, and I wasn't going to go. So um, Adele said, we're probably going to miss our flight, are we? And I said, yeah, looks like it. And all of a sudden, this lady appears with a badge, formal, from the government. Hello, are you Evangelist Jonathan Shuttlesworth? Well, you don't know if people are upset. So I said, why do you ask? Because if she's upset, I'd say, no, I'm Teddy Shuttlesworth. <laughs> Ted D. Shuttlesworth. She said, no, I, I was in your meetings this week at the crusade. I thought it was, oh, yes, I'm jo that's me. She said, uh, she said, uh, are you getting ready to get on that flight? I said, yeah. She said, well, you're not going to make it if you have to wait in that line. I said, I was just telling my wife that she'd come with me. So she come, I come with her. And then we walk to the diplomats only line. And there was one diplomat in line. And she said, excuse me, sir. And pushed me by hand. He, he looked upset. I'm like, who's this guy? And then walked us through. And when I turned back, all the people in line were taking pictures of me. Because it's like, if I'm getting walked by, it's like, he must be fit. Man, I never knew Justin Bieber looked so ugly in person. <laughs> you know, if you see Bradley Cooper in real life, he has like no muscles. Must be all special effects. They're taking pictures trying to figure out uh, who I am. Then I went, to, I went to St. Lucia last year to go preach. And same thing. Service, the crusade started at 7 o'clock. My plane landed at 6.43 or something like that, p.m., and so I got to clear customs, and, and I'm, it's going to be tight. So I'm waiting in line. I got like a track suit on. And so, uh, you know, I know preachers wear suits on long flights. You look good when you get on the plane. When you get off the plane, you look like you owe money to bookies. So I wore a, a, a soccer suit. How come so many people understood that here? It's very odd. So I'm waiting in line, minding my own business. And this lady's eating a sandwich that works at the airport, and she goes, uh, Brother Jonathan. I said, yeah. She said, I was here when you preached last year. I said, uh, I said oh, that's great. Nice to meet you. I went over and shook her hand. She said, um, aren't you preaching tonight? I said, I am, yeah. She said, well, I don't think you should have to wait in this line. I agree. <laughs> Come with me. Now, she didn't even walk me to the thing. She just took my passport and my ticket and then walked me to another door, and they had my bags waiting for me in that door. And before anybody cleared the customs line, I was in the car to go preach. Everybody say, hi above. Hi above. All, the All the nations of the world. And so you should carry yourself that way. However you see yourself is how you'll be. You have to see yourself from the pages of Scripture that I've been redeemed, not just from sin and to make heaven, but God has made me a leader in my generation. I can stand up straight and walk tall because God has something for me to do on this earth. Everybody say high above. High above, high above all the nations of the world. You will experience, not you'll believe in them, you'll experience them. You'll experience all these blessings, not some, all, if you obey the Lord your God. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They'll attack you from one direction, but they'll run from you in seven. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fill your storehouses with grain. Will fill your storehouses with grain. That means before the need arises, the provision is there ahead of time. Fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he's giving you. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you as his holy people as he swore he would do. Then all the nations of the world or the heathen or people that don't even believe like you do 
They'll see that you're a people claimed by God and they'll stand in awe of you. The Lord will give you prosperity. I don't believe in prosperity. Then rip that page out of your Bible, but it's still there anyway. The Lord will give you prosperity. I don't like that word. It's amazing how the Lord felt to not consult you when he wrote the Bible. The Lord will give you prosperity. So they can fire off on Facebook and Twitter all they want. Long after Twitter and Facebook is dead, there'll still be prosperity for the children of God. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, blessing you with many children, numerous livestock, and abundant crops. I don't believe in prosperity. Yeah, I read your profile. There's a lot of stuff you don't believe in. You don't believe there's only two genders. So it's not my fault you have a problem. Well, I don't believe there's two genders. There's a t-shirt they make that says there's more than two genders. And when you go to order it online, you still have to choose male or female. Case closed. So just because people in the world are confused doesn't mean I have to join them. Can you say amen? amen. You know, you have people write you on, on social media. You preach that prosperity gospel. I don't like it. Yes, your profile picture is a wolf with glowing green eyes. I'm actually relieved you don't enjoy my messages. <laughs> you don't really want demons to like you, what you preach. That was an excellent message, Reverend. But basically what happens is, if you don't guard against it, you end up with, it, with this mentality from going to school and watching TV that really you need to come up with a kind of Christianity that's kind of like palatable to the world. But the Bible says, let me remind you, brethren, that friendship with this world makes you an enemy of God. If the ladies on The View wanted to have me on as a guest and promote my newest book, I'd burn all the books and go figure out what I was preaching because we don't preach something that lines up with a new world establishment. What we preach is actually what's preventing the devil from having full reign over this earth. So if the devil doesn't like a doctrine, it's not time to back off of it. It's time to dive headlong into it and receive the blessings of Abraham that belong to you. If you receive that this morning, put those hands together again and let God know you're interested. Hallelujah. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, blessing you with many children, numerous livestock, and abundant crops. The Lord will send rain at the proper time from his rich treasury in the heavens and will bless all the work you do. You will lend to many, but thou shalt not borrow. If you listen to these commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today and be careful to obey them, the Lord will make you the head and never the tail. You will always be on top. You will never be at the bottom. How many of you know life's full of mountains and valleys? Uh -uh. Always on top, never at the bottom. They'll say in church, how many of you know to get from one mountaintop to the next mountaintop, you have to go through a valley? This is not geography class. This is church. And the Bible doesn't say ups and downs. The Bible says from glory to glory, from victory to victory, from strength to strength. I'm gonna tell you something right now. We already read the blessing has nothing to do with what nation you come from or what race you are, what your skin color, whether you're male or female, whether you're Jew or Gentile, and it also has nothing to do with age. Don't let people put, uh, well, you're just a poor Bible college, I'm a poor Bible college student. You're a poor Bible college student because you have a poor brain because you've decided to confess the opposite of what the Bible says. Did you know the same God that blesses you when you're old will bless you when you're young? Did you know time doesn't change anything? The truth of God's word and you believing it in your heart, you know, if you're not saved when you're 11 years old, if you wait till you're 70, do you just get saved? No, the thing starts to work as soon as you believe it with your heart and confess it with your mouth. 
You can be healed in your youth and healed in your old age. And you can be blessed while you're training for the ministry, blessed while you get out of Bible college, and the blessing will continue to grow as you walk by the word, word of God. Listen, always, everybody say always the head. Always. Say never the tail. Yes. Lift both hands all over this room. The last battle that you ever lost will be the last one that you ever lose. From this day forward, no more ups and downs, just ups and ups. From glory to glory, from victory to victory, open doors, the hand of God visibly on everything that pertains to you in the name of Jesus Christ. If you receive that, let the loudest praise of the entire day come up out of this sanctuary to the God who makes it good. Hallelujah! Turn to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua, the first chapter. Verse 2. Joshua 1, 2. God speaks to Joshua, carries it on. Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land that I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you'll be on land that I've already given to you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites, no one will be able to stand against you. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will never fail you and I'll never abandon you. Be strong and courageous. For you are the ones who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. I mean, if you know God didn't tell us to be successful, he told us to be faithful. Wrong. You will be successful in everything you do. You will be successful in everything you do. Whatever failure has run in your family, that failure ends with you. Your marriage will be successful. Your children raising will be successful. Your business will be successful. Your ministry will be successful in Jesus' mighty name. I will give you good success in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night. Let it never depart from your mouth. So you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper. There's that word again. I'm going to rip that page out too. And succeed, prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command, command, not suggestion. Be strong and courageous. Never be afraid. Never be discouraged. Lift your hands all over this room. Any intimidation tactic of the devil by word or deed that's intimidated you, made you fearful, made you discouraged, I come against it now with the Bible. And instead, I loose the gift of faith into your spirit to say I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. You're not going down. You're going to have good success in everything you do, whether the devil likes it or not. Whether the devil likes it or not, he's too small to be consulted. You are blessed. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Never be afraid. Never be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Yeah, but Jonathan, that was written to Joshua. Interesting how when Joshua wrote it down, God didn't say, hey, what are you doing writing that down? This is just between me and you. The rest of those people, I'm not interested. He actually had it written down for perpetuity so anybody can read it and believe it. And then further proof, turn to Psalm 1. I, I, I love these three verses. Praise God. Psalm 1, 1 to 3. Oh, the joys of those who don't follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees. Why do they have morning and night service? Meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank. They bear fruit in every season. 
Their leaves never wither, and whatsoever they do, it shall prosper. Whosoever, the Bible says. It doesn't say if Joshua does these things. It says whosoever. It must say whosoever. There's an old hymn that the title of the hymn and the chorus of the hymn is whosoever surely meaneth me. When the Bible says whosoever, that guy that wrote that was a Baptist preacher. He must have been studying one day. And when he saw the word whosoever, whosoever, whosoever surely meaneth me. That any time the Bible says whosoever will listen and hearken unto my word and do what it says, I will bless him. That Baptist guy in 18 whatever wrote whosoever surely meaneth me. Hallelujah. I've had that on my spirit for about eight days. Whosoever surely meaneth me. And whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Let's say if Joshua speaks to the mountain. It says whosoever will speak unto the mountain and tell it to move. Whosoever surely meaneth me. Everybody say whosoever surely meaneth me. And so when the Bible says, whosoever will hearken to do all that I've commanded them to do, whosoever means me, that if I walk in the light of God's word and refuse to do what MTV and Showtime and HBO and everything else tells me to do and say, not interested, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to take action on the word of God. Then whosoever, the same God that blessed Abraham, the same God that blessed Isaac, the same God that blessed Jacob and Moses and Joshua and David and Solomon, that God that blessed them, whosoever surely meaneth me and it means you. Everything that pertains to your life, it swings up permanently from today in Jesus' mighty name. So those were my introductory scriptures. <laughs> my message, eight fundamental truths of financial prosperity. Because the blessing... Is more than just money. And that's what the, you know, they love saying that in America. How many of you know the blessing is more than just money? True. But if you have joy and peace, and they're getting ready to repossess your home and kick you and your wife and kids out on the street, and you still have joy and peace, that's not from a blessing, that's from a mental problem. So I don't care how much any dim-witted religious person tries to gloss it over like you can have some kind of great length without any money. They're stupid. It takes money, A, to survive. And we're not here to survive. B, it takes money to do the will of God for your life. And number three, you can't do the commands of Christ. Not without money, without an excess of money. Feed the hungry. How are you going to feed the hungry when you, as a Christian, have to use the church's food program for your own food? Now, if you just started coming, no big deal. But if it's been 13 years, it's time to buck up. I don't give my daughter a hard time for feeding her when she's you know, six years old, four years old. At 41, if she says, Dad, I'm hungry, I'm saying, listen, you got to figure something out. Everybody say, grow up. Yeah, there's baby Christians that desire the milk of God's word, but then the Bible says you're supposed to become full grown and mature, desiring the meat and be a blessing to others. From today, you won't just survive. There will be an overflowing cup where you're a blessing to a hurting world. Eight fundamental truths of financial prosperity. I've heard a lot of preachers attack it. Most of them drink. People say, what did you think about what they said? People say a lot of things when they're drunk. But this is what the Bible says. Eight fundamental truths of financial prosperity. Number one that we've already covered in depth. The blessing of Abraham belongs to me. Say that with me. The blessing of Abraham belongs to me. And if you have an IQ north of 50, there would be no possible way to study the word of God and say that the blessing of Abraham leaves out money. So Abraham departed, Genesis 12, 1 to 4, and then chapter 13, verse 2. And Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and in gold, for the Lord had blessed him in everything. Say it out loud. Abraham's blessings belong to me. So what did, what did Paul say in Philippians chapter 4? He said, not uh, verse 11, Philippians 4, 11. Not that I was ever in need, 
The Bible says in Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'll never be in lack. Lift your hands all over this place. The blessing of Abraham is that you will never lack. You'll have an overflowing cup. There will never be insufficiency. There will always be surplus to be a blessing to a hurting world. If you believe that with me, let your amen be the loudest. Eight fundamental truths of financial prosperity. Number one, the blessing of Abraham belongs to me. And it says in Genesis 17, to me and my children forever. So it belongs to my children. They turn out differently than the world's children. They go to services like this and it makes them peculiar. First time my wife ever trusted me to wash my daughter by myself. When she was two and a half, she came into the room with nothing on but a diaper. And she was hungry. And she said, hey, Pa. And I told you, my wife's Puerto Rican. I thought I'd get called Poppy. (laughs) We always said Dad, you know, in my house. But somehow I got Pa like it's 18, 17, little house on the prairie. (laughs) Hey, Pa. She got a mouth full of chewing tobacco. She... So she comes into the living room, I kid you not, nothing on but a diaper, puts her hand on the like waistband of the diaper and goes, hey, Pa, get me some yogurt in Jesus' name. I said, Camila, I'm your dad. I'm not a demon. You can just say please. Whatever new disorders sweep over children, And causes them to be able to not be able to function in society. It'll never touch your house in Jesus' name. Your children will be the top in their class. They'll do great and mighty things for God. And they'll join you in heaven after this life has come to an end. By the blessings of God. If you receive that, celebrate it ahead of time. Take 20 good seconds. My children, my children are blessed. Abraham's blessings are mine. Doesn't matter what Bernie Sanders thinks. I think that's too much money for one person to have. No one's asking you. You're not a Bible character. You're a failing presidential candidate. The world has a plan to limit the common man's wealth. But God has a plan to take the beggar from the dunghill and set him among princes. And that's where you'll, listen to me. This is not a point. This is just extra. It doesn't matter where you are now. Don't ever confuse where you're at now for where you're going. And I tell every person from the back to the front, where you started is not where you're gonna finish. You're going higher and higher and higher and higher to stick it in the face of the devil that God's word still works. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm For the Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever. I did my best to teach. I wore like a suit and everything and had a thing. Talk, let this word never depart from your mouth. You know, my wife and I were staying at the Motel 8 in Vermont when our first year of marriage. And we're getting bit by bugs in the biz, the only place we could afford to to stay. I said, you know what I didn't sit and say? I said, that's hard being in the ministry. I looked at her while we were scratching our backs. I said, it won't always be like this. 
God's going to take us out of this as we keep going. And I'm telling you, don't let any devil deceive you. Where you started will not be where you finish. Be not weary in well-doing, for you shall reap a reward if you do not give up and quit. The devil works by discouragement. That's why it's in Joshua like nine times. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Because the devil can't stop God's word. He can only get you to be tired and turn back. Well, if it was working, it would have worked by now. Have your aunt with the saggy Tweety Bird tattoo talk to you about tithing. If you had all that tithe money bank, you could have bought a car by now. <laughs> and people turn back. 10 out of 12 spies say, I can't do it. But there is a room full of Joshua's and Caleb's that say, I am well able. You're not going to finish where you are now. God has a glorious future with your name on it. Our second point today. Everybody say, I'm blessed. You know, my sister, the church I'm going to preach at tonight, Lord willing, my sister, my sister and her husband are the pastors. And when she was sitting there, the Lord quickened a story back to me about how my mom, I, I, don't, I must have been staying with a friend or something, but when my, when my sister was a little kid, littler than me, my dad was on the road preaching. Everybody say, I'm blessed. Everybody say, when your enemy attacks you, I'll make him run from you in seven directions. So my mom's on this back road in Pennsylvania. It's like a garbage road, like a, a side, side road. But it was the shortest path home. And it had snowed. Oh, I forgot I was in Florida. When it gets below 32 degrees, instead of raining, these white flakes fall and settle on the ground, and they call it snow. So Pennsylvania doesn't do like a good job cleaning the robes up. So my mom's driving on that back road in our busted up Volvo we had back then. And then she slid off the road into a ditch. There's no, I mean, it's like back road through the woods. So she's in a ditch. Now, this is like 88, 89, 1989. No cell phone. You know, there's no pay phones. You're just, just in the woods. And so my mom's thinking, what am I going to do? You know, right when you start crying. My husband's on the, if I wish I had a husband that was here instead of my husband's out preaching. I'm stuck here with my little kid. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, then a pickup truck pulls up. And these two, these two, well, uh, you know, I want to probably shouldn't say the word redneck, but <laughs> these two guys, you know, with mullets. <laughs> come out and say, uh, and say, hey, we'll help you get a tow truck, get in the car. And my mom told me, she's probably watching right now, just turned 62. She said, I felt in my spirit, you know, your inward witness. Don't get in the, the, the truck with them. So she says, no, thank you. I have help coming. Um, they, this is how you can tell they were bad guys. Because, you know, you go to help somebody change their tire or whatever, and they don't want help. It's like, great. Now I can get on with my day. So they start really trying to coerce her to get in the car. No, come on. Get in our truck. Because my sister was telling me I left that part out because I just told the second part. But she said, no, it was getting, like, bad. And right as they're trying to force my mom in the car with no husband to help her or whatever, a police car comes up behind her. Hallelujah. And it wasn't just any cop. It was a, a, a police officer from Bentleyville, Pennsylvania, named Terry Openbriar, who ended up going into the ministry. He got saved in one of my dad's crusades when he was a cop. And he, his jurisdiction in Bentleyville, my mom was in Bridgeville. Bentley, this means nothing to you, but I'm just telling you, he, he's like, where he's in charge of was like 45 minutes away from where my mom slid off the road. So when she saw him, you know, Bentleyville cop, it'd be like having like a Lakeland police officer come help you out in, in Brandon. See how good I'm doing with like examples and public speaking? 
I'm really trying up here. So, <laughs> maybe it was just for you. <laughs> so, so the cop comes up and those guys quickly get in their truck and leave. And my mom said, Terry, how are you patrolling this road? It's not even near your town. Plus, it's like way off the beaten path. He said, I, I, I was pulled over in my car doing speed traps and I was praying. And I felt the Spirit of God tell me that you were in trouble and told me what road you, the guy's been saved like less than a year. And he said, I drove, now think of this. He came 10 minutes after my mom slid off the road from 45 minutes away. You know what that, and the devil had people to come. You know, that's like the beginning of an episode of Forensic Files. So only God knows what the devil had planned. The devil had a plan for my mom and sister's destruction. But before the devil's plan could get off the ground, when you're blessed, things don't work like they work for everyone else. Before my, listen, before my mother slid in the ditch, God already mobilized a police officer to pull her out. We didn't have money for a tow truck. We didn't have money to get the car fixed. They took care of everything. I'm telling you right now, if you're in a ditch and you slid in there, don't know how you got in, God has already mobilized help to pull you out of the ditch, pull you back on the road, and keep going forward. You're not going to die where you are now. You're going up in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Number one, the blessings of Abraham are mine. Number two, blessing is a foundational, financial blessing is a financial doctrine of Christ. It's not the icing on the cake. Second Corinthians 8, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was very rich, yet he became poor for our sakes, that by his poverty he could make you rich. And the word rich in the original Greek means rich. That's why they translated it like that. Number three, poverty is a curse. Eight fundamental truths. These are inarguable. Nobody can argue these from Scripture. Poverty in the Bible is not a blessing. Poverty is a curse. And anybody that doesn't think so has never been poor. Poverty is a curse. That's why if you notice, all the anti-prosperity preachers are rich. Google them and see what their net worth is. The two top anti-prosperity preachers, one is net worth 14 million, one is 11.4 million. I'd feel like kind of a hypocrite writing a book against prosperity and making $3 million off of it. It's amazing how they keep the money. Poverty is not a blessing, it's a curse. If God loves poverty, how come he never once gave it as a reward for someone obeying him? Never once. Abraham, if you do what I tell you to do, I'm going to make you super poor. <laughs> Everybody say, poverty is a curse. Is a curse. Say, I am, I am redeemed. Yeah, The wealth of the rich are their fortress. The poverty of the poor is their destruction. That's in the book of Proverbs. Number four, Satan desires to control the world through the wealth system. Satan can't control how many people are called into ministry. That's not his domain. Satan can't control the anointing and power that's released when people preach the gospel. That's not under his control. So Satan works to stop the supply line of money so that people who are called into ministry cannot go out and preach the gospel. You know, you'll see CNN criticize the prosperity gospel. They don't want the gospel. What, what are they doing for the gospel? What time do they give on their network for people to preach on Sunday night or what? No, they hate preachers. They hate righteousness. They hate God. Where am I giving this speech in Atlanta? <laughs> so why would you ever run what you believe by people that want to see you destroyed? Want to see the church destroyed? Want to see its influence destroyed? You go to build a casino... They'll cover it on the news like they're curing children's cancer in there. New casino opening up. There's men going into sports bet right now on the Super Bowl. Yeah, their child support payments, money they don't have, going out broke. You'd think they're doing the best thing in the world. And then when you go to build a church, they have to have nine committee meetings in the city. Does there really need to be a church there? Why do you have to build a church that big? But I got news for you. God has a plan in this last hour of time that the wealth of the wicked will get stripped out of the hands of the wicked and brought into the hands of the just. 
And that's why the devil has his shorts in a knot. Because he knows what's written. I said he knows what's written. When there were huge attacks against healing ministries in the 1940s, the devil knew what was coming. The greatest wave of healing evangelists and miracles that the United States had ever seen. And now there's this big uprising against blessing and financial blessing. God's name is Jehovah Jireh. God's name is El Shaddai. And the devil's trying to do everything in his power to seed enough unbelief into your heart that you miss out on the greatest wealth transfer since the days of Egypt. But guess what? The devil's too late. The men and women that God's going to use to see the America shaken by the mighty hand of God, they're not out there. They're here right now. And God has a blessing for you. Number five, eight fundamental truths of financial prosperity. Sacrifice produces reward. That's where people that don't understand prosperity all get tripped up. These guys talk about blessing. Jesus said to sacrifice. It's not one or the other. He tells you to sacrifice because the sacrifice produces a reward. Thanks for six amens. I'll, I'll, I mean, if you look, look it up when you go home, good luck finding anybody in the Bible that sacrificed anything and God didn't speak to her and say, now that you've done that, watch what I'm going to do. Yeah. Sacrifice produces reward. I was sitting next to a drunk lady in first class. My wife was home. Just to, I don't want to, wasn't my wife. I, I, was on, I was on a, important to be clear. So this lady had had like four glasses of champagne. She's talking on and on. I took two NyQuil to go to sleep because it was a long flight. She talked so much with NyQuil in my system, I couldn't fall asleep. <laughs> so she's talking, drunk talking, you know, like not important talking. And then uh, she gets done and she goes, well, here, I've been talking this whole time and I haven't asked you anything about you. What do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher. You know, the way people react when you tell them you're a preacher, I'm going to start just telling people I'm an assassin. Because I, 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 I bet you that would get a more favorable reaction. What do you do for a I'm an assassin. Oh, like James Bond, that's cool. So I, I, the lady goes, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher. Almost spits her shit. A preacher? Sitting in first class? Yes, first class is only reserved for middle-aged drunks. I'm very sorry. She said, a preacher sitting in first class. I thought you were supposed to give all your money to the poor. See, that's what the devil, that we're supposed to give, and then by giving, it makes us poor. God doesn't have us give to the poor so that you can become one of them. I told that woman, I said, I keep trying to give all my money to the poor. It keeps boomeranging back. <laughs> he who gives to the poor will never lack. This is Prover uh, Proverbs 28, 27. He who gives to the poor shall never lack anything. When the Lord tells you to sacrifice, it's not so you can do without and others can have. He said in Mark chapter 10, read it, Mark 10, 17 to the end of the chapter. He talks about how, he tells the rich young ruler, sell everything you have. People will stop when they argue against prosperity right before verse 28. Jesus told the rich young ruler to sell everything he had. Why don't you read the rest of the chapter? And the disciples spoke up when he wanted and said, well, we have. What did Jesus say? That's right, you should. And I'm going to name a book of the Bible after you, so just be quiet. He said, that's right. And anyone who gives for my sake and the sake of the gospel, property, houses, and possession, will receive now and in this life 100 times as much as what they've given. Sacrifice produces reward. Number six. F 
fundamental, indisputable truth of financial prosperity. What you make happen for others, God makes happen for you. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 8. Know this, that whatever good any man does, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether bond or free. What you make happen for other people, God makes happen for you. No man ever gives at a loss. You cannot give yourself broke in the kingdom. It's not possible. What you make happen for others, God makes happen for you. I'm about out of time. But I'll uh, relate one story. The church we grew up in in Pennsylvania, same near where my mom ran off the road. My dad was at, it was, a, it was a type of denomination that had like a business meeting once a year. So that pastor had taken the church from 60 people to 800 people. And now he was an older guy. And they wanted to sell him the parsonage. The church owned the parsonage. He had been living in it 30 years. And they said, well, he should have some kind of asset. So let's sell him the parsonage. So they're debating in the meeting what to sell it to him for. My dad got really upset. And I could tell when my dad's upset because usually it was me that did it. But this time it wasn't me. <laughs> but his like, face started getting red. And my dad never like spoke up ever. And all of a sudden he stands up and says, can I say something? They said, sure. He said, Ralph Volt took this church with 60 people and has been living in that house for 30 years and we're going to debate on what to sell it to him for? Why don't we give him the house? And the pastor's eyes went up high and he said, well, I, I, you know, I'm going to excuse myself. I don't think I should be in. And they vote and they vote to give the guy the house as a gift free and clear. My dad took a stand for him to get a free home. So that was when I was like 10. When I was 16, six years later, my dad gets a call from a woman. Tiff, I was doing my devotions today. And she's crying hard. The Lord spoke to me to give you my house. Now that house, we had lived in rented homes our whole life. That house is like just under 5,000 square feet, seven acres in a city that no one has an acre. A river runs through the property. My dad loves deer. There's a breakfast room where deer feed out in the field the whole time. Two fireplaces, four bedrooms, something like that. Big home. And the lady turned it over to my dad. And when she turned it over to him, the Lord spoke clear. My dad started crying because the Lord spoke to him. Do you remember when you took a stand for your pastor to have a free home? When you made the decision to do that, I made a decision to give you one too. What you make happen for other people. Say it out loud. What I make happen for others, God will make happen for me. I started paying for people's private Christian school tuition before I ever had a kid. I did not do it to help them. I did it to help me. Because I knew what I made happen for them, God would take care of me. We signed Camila up for pre-kindergarten class at a private place. Because if they give my daughter a questionnaire about what gender she is, there will be a wrath <laughs> that has not been felt since Old Testament days. I'll come in dressed in camel hair with honey and crickets in my beard and stuff. Get out. <laughs> we signed her up for pre-kindergarten and got a call in less than an hour after we signed her up. Someone found out you signed your daughter up and paid your tuition. What you make, ha well, life's not a mystery. Bl blessings aren't randomly stumbled upon. What I make happen for others, God will make happen for me. Number, number seven, no matter how long you've been in a hole, number seven, God can turn everything around in one day. The Israelites weren't broken out of Egypt over 40 years of court hearings. They were broken out in one night. And number eight, what type of seed produces financial overflow? Many people give in every offering and they've never seen. And that's why some people start to resent the message of financial blessing. I, I, we give. You and your mother and I have given. We, and I know those guys talk about that. We've never seen that. There's a type of seed that produces abundance. Number one, it has, there has to be three things in place every time you give. Very simple. Number one, a seed born out of your love for God. Not because it's offering time and we have to give or this guy won't be quiet. Okay, they need a roof. We have money. let a seed that's born out of a love for God and what he's done for you. 1 Corinthians 13, if I give my body to be burned, 
but have not love or charity, it profits me nothing. Anything that love is not at the root of doesn't, doesn't bring you anything. Number one, your seed has to be born out of a love for God. Number two, a seed born out of a love for God's kingdom. Not just God, you have to love what he loves. You know, there's, there's a few classes of people, maybe three. You watch Pastor Rodney doing this tour, and it's, okay, whatever. Then there's other people, oh, that's great. And then there's other people that when you see that, it's, I can't go to Hong Kong. I can't go to South Korea. I can't go there. But he's taking Jesus to them, and I want to do something to make sure those people meet Jesus the same way I met him and he impacted me. Where you have a love, an infectious love of the advancement of the kingdom of God on earth. Your seed's born out of that. And then number three, a seed sown in expectation of a return, of a harvest. How many know we don't give to get? Speak for yourself. Because if we weren't supposed to have an expectation to receive, then Jesus shouldn't have said a lot of the stuff that he said. Luke 6.38, Luke 6, give and you shall what? Yeah, Jesus said that. So I'm sorry you don't like it, but you're not Jesus. Give and not you might receive. Give and you shall receive. I will cause men to give liberally into your bosom. Press down, shaken together, and running over, your gift will return to you. So the same gift doesn't return. It multiplies like a shaken up soda and comes back. You have to give. Otherwise, you give with what I call a donation mentality. Same as you'd give to PBS, which I hope you don't. Or Easter Seals or Red Cross or whatever. This is not a charity. This is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in a lot of countries, they register as a charity, but you can't give. Well, Pastor Rodney is going to um, Asia, and it costs money for him to go there, so let's get. That's not it. You give out of a love for God, a love for an advancement of God's kingdom, and then you don't let any religious devil talk you out of an expectation of a harvest. Father, as I plant this seed in your kingdom, you said whatever I give. If I give liberally, I will reap a liberal harvest, a bountiful harvest. As I give this to you, I thank you in advance that the windows of heaven are coming open over my life and a blessing that I can't contain is being poured out over me and my family. I've never understood. It's like I've been to other countries, but I've lived in this one. I don't understand why preachers feel like it's their job to make people feel like they're not going to go to hell and then to make sure nobody ever feels like they're going to be blessed. You know, if you're worried about sin, don't worry about it. God, under, Where's that in the Bible? And then they'll do the same thing with blessing. Now, how many of you know we don't give to get? It's not about our riches. Yeah, because there's so many billionaires in the room that we need to temper people's enthusiasm. God doesn't want Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby to be the only two people with money in the kingdom of God. God wants to raise up an army of kingdom financiers. A new generation of Abrahams, Isaacs, and Jacobs that poverty loses your address and your cup runneth over from this day forward. Stand on your feet, everybody. Bow your head and close your eyes and lift both hands to the Lord. From today, the blessing of the Lord will overtake you. It will be visible to the heathen. You will never have to tell anybody, I might not look like it, but the Bible says, no, the blessings of the Lord will drip off of every aspect of your life. It'll be clear to unbelievers that you've tapped into something else. Every mocking member of your family that thinks you take this stuff too seriously, the Lord will make a show of you openly and let them watch. Today will be the lowest that you ever are. And you will fulfill every plan God has for your life with speed. Not by might. Not by power. But by the blessings of God that are yours today. Receive that today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. With your hands lifted, just begin to thank God out of your mouth. Prosteg India. I'm doing it too. I thank you, Father. Thank you for a new week. Thank you that surely goodness and mercy will follow me every day of this week. 
Thank you for new doors coming open. Thank you for bigger platforms to preach the gospel and reach more people in less time. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your promotion coming. In Jesus' name, thank you for lifting me higher than any man could ever take me as I pursue you, as I act upon your word. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Put your hands down, bow your head, and close your eyes. You can believe in the blessing of God all you want, but until you become Abraham's seed, it's just something you read in a book. There has to be a spiritual rebirth that grafts you into the blessing of God. If you've never received Jesus Christ, remember the opening text, Galatians 3, all who are in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received. You have to receive. He broke poverty on the, on the cross. He loosed the blessings of Abraham by his resurrection. Until Christ comes into your heart, you're an outsider looking in. You're sitting with other people from a different family watching them enjoy God's blessings. But nobody wants you shut out here. We held this meeting first and foremost for those that are here that have never connected with Christ or you once connected with Christ and then fell away. Today is your day to come to the Lord. All the devil has to do to keep you under the curse of poverty and lack and one thing going wrong after another is to get you to put this off for one more hour. You know, well, I got a lot of things I need to get cleaned up, you know. I didn't, I, you'll never get it cleaned up. Furthermore, Jesus didn't say, clean up your life and come to me. He said, come just as you are, and I'll give you new life. If you're here tonight or today and you realize the reason struggles come at you left, right, and center is because you're not blessed. You're not under the blessing. You're under the curse. You're not listening to God. American Christianity doesn't work. Modern Christianity doesn't work. That you treat the Bible like a buffet and do the parts you like and argue with the parts you don't. Everything about the blessing started with if you will fully hearken diligently and fully obey. Everybody say fully obey. Some people have one area in their life that they've never surrendered to God. The Bible says it's the little fox that spoils the vine. Some people have just one area. They've never surrendered it to God. Still living in iniquity. And God's calling you today to get under the blood of Jesus Christ. Let him wash your sins away. Let him cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And join this great family, the family of God, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Where all the curses of this world lose access to you. And the blessing of God is magnetized to you no matter where you are on planet earth. If you're here and you say, Jonathan, that's me. I need to fully surrender my life to Jesus Christ and I'm not putting it off one hour. I want to leave here knowing I'm saved. Then quickly, I want you to lift your hand up high and wave it at me and we'll pray right now. In Jesus' name. I see you. Keep it up. Don't be ashamed. Everyone has had to do this and everyone should. It's all well that's going to matter on Judgment Day. Keep your hands up. God bless you. Lots of hands. Very quickly, everybody that lifted a hand and meant business with God, quickly come to the altar in Jesus' mighty name. Give them a great hand clap as they come. Come and join us now. Quickly come. Every hand that was lifted. God bless you as you come. God bless you. Keep coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Keep clapping. Te prosto go prosto. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Anybody else before we pray? Yeah. Get your family under the blood. Let everything change from today. You'll never regret it. Hallelujah.
lift both hands to the Lord and I'm going to give you the words to say but it's not a recital say it from your heart and as you pray this to God even while you're praying the Lord's going to do a work on the inside of you it's like the valve of trouble gets turned off <laughs> you know when that cop came to pick my mother up out of the ditch no amount of money can buy that the blessing gives you what, what money can't buy ended up with her own personal security force by the blessing of God and God will do that for you Say this out loud. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, come here today I come here today to surrender my life. Surrender my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Me all my sins. Cleanse, me of all wickedness. Cleanse me of all wickedness. I believe in my heart. In my heart. You, raised you raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth. With my mouth. Jesus, Christ Jesus Christ is King of Kings, King of kings. Lord of Lords. And my, and my Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your power. Where I was weak, make me strong. Thank you that I'm blessed. Thank you that my children are blessed. Thank you that everything I touch is blessed. In Jesus' name. And as you stay there, just let the Lord touch you. He's touching many of you right now. Would you mind if I prayed for you? Yeah. This guy, just to tell you, you reminded me of this guy in Montreal I just prayed for on Friday night. He had a problem, and he lost all his peripheral vision and most of his front vision. And they, they just texted me on the flight down here that it all came back in a day. Same? Yeah. That's what I mean. So now I'm like, if you wonder why I was smiling at you weird, that's why. Because I knew God, God's going to do the same thing. Let me pray for you. In Jesus' name. Everything that this accident damaged. Behold. I command everything to return. In Jesus' name. I love you. Look forward to your report. It'll all come back. In Jesus' name. Hey, welcome to the family of God. Your sins are all forgiven. A new life begins right now and you're on your way to heaven. Don't turn back for anything. Don't let anybody drag you back to the life you just decided to leave. When I get to heaven, I want you right next to me. And we'll high five and share the story how we overcame. Thank you for watching today on YouTube. Please press the subscribe button and also the notification button and like and get the word out so others can watch.